Welcome everyone. We're here today with Ruth Allen and Pete Phoenix. Uh, they are working on a project called Climate Emergency Centers in the United Kingdom. And this is Glenn Goodwin and I'm Dale Walkinen and we are both from Facing Future. Hi. Um, hi. So um, we'd love to hear just a little outline of how the project is working and how it relates to um, both social change and climate change and how that's helping people be more resilient. It's a very good question. I don't know who wants to kick off first, Neil Ruth. A um, little bit of background, I suppose, Climate Emergency Centres Network came out of uh, 30 years of grassroots uh, community and environmental action in, in the UK. Um, so our particular group started after the Rio Earth Summit, uh, setting up eco community centres. Um, and then most recently during the lockdown, I've, I've written down a handbook, how to set up a climate emergency centre in 10 steps. Um, to pass on the knowledge from that kind of 30 years to other groups around the UK and hopefully around the world who want to reuse an empty or vacant property in their area to, to benefit the local community and the environment. Uh, I'm sure that after COVID, there are many more vacant spaces. Yeah. Uh, we see that everywhere. A lot of places uh, could not survive. So uh, this project is particularly timely. Um, Glenn is in Spain and is also interested in possibilities of setting up these kind of centers there in Barcelona. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I would be more more than interested in, in spreading the word out here. Brilliant. So yeah, because the idea is so that each center is autonomous and they're based in their local communities and run by people in the local community. So they're looking at how to build local community needs and address those. Um, but doing it in a, an environmentally sustainable and resilient way. Mm -hmm. So each climate emergency center has its own focus and its own uh, board of whatever it is, directors. Uh, yep. They are working on different projects. Uh, yep. How many of them are there now in the UK? We've got about 37 teams now, I think. Mm -hmm. And there are now so six of them have buildings. So, and we're looking, there's one or two that are probably going to come online with a building in the next few weeks, so. Mm -hmm. So basically what we show people is, is you know, we walk them through a process to set up a, a, a not-for-profit legal entity, like a not-for-profit company or a charity. Uh, they then identify an empty uh, building in their community, of which many of our communities can see a lot of empty buildings out there. Um, okay. And then they approach the council that's hopefully already declared climate emergency. Um, and also a, a local property developer who might own some of these empty spaces and see if they can work out a deal to use it for the good of, of the community, basically. And uh, a lot of councils, when approached, are really, really amenable to this. Um, there's, you know, like I say, 330 councils are declared climate emergency, but they don't have enough funds or resources to actually open these spaces up. So this is kind of a win-win situation of getting together the local community, the local council, and local business to try and kind of regenerate a space in an area that will help the community and the environment. Mm -hmm. So we kind of big support network for groups to help each other. Do you help with the negotiation between kind of property developers and? Yeah, yeah, we do that. We've got a, a secret weapon, which is Linda, our uh, older trustee. She has a California team originally, um, oh. but she's a very great organizer and she helps to negotiate licenses and uh, leases with the, we call it a meanwhile lease. You basically use the building in the meanwhile uh, before it develops. So some of these buildings sit empty for one to three to five years. Mm. In our communities, you know, the old saying, we recycle bottles, cans and plastic. Why don't we recycle the empty buildings in all of our communities? Mm. And one phrase we want to get across is the intelligent reuse of the infrastructure of, uh, of the, the, the vacant property infrastructure in all our towns and cities. Mm. And it's good for the local economy, it's good for the local community, it's good for, for the environment. So it's kind of a win-win situation for everyone. Mm. So as climate, as climate change uh, accelerates, and we, we know that it's happening rather rapidly, uh, communities will need to suddenly adapt to new circumstances. So having these kind of centers is very helpful because then people already are organized, already are talking to each other. Mm. So the social uh, part of it feeds right into uh, being more resilient. What these centres really do, I've seen them having run for 30 years, the magic that happens when you have a space, it brings together, it's kind of like a mothership 
for many other smaller projects to people come in and ask, can I use that space for bike repair or, you know, computer repair or for a meeting for this group or theater rehearsal or whatever. Yeah, we saw one project where you had a group that was preparing for a rainforest uh, oh, yeah. um, action and then they were getting ready in their costumes and their uh, props and things in, in a community center. That yeah. looked like an exciting project. That was what, um, Amazon, uh, that was an Amazon group doing a, a kind of mock-up of the Last Supper, uh, you know, the one with Jesus and the 12 disciples. So this one had like the indigenous elder leader in the middle with like mm -hmm. 12 variety of rainforest animals that, you know, their homes are being destroyed and really brilliant piece right. of video with mixing in fires of the Amazon and mm -hmm. facts mm -hmm. about what's going on with all these different animals and the rainforest burning behind. It was a, quite an exciting film set to be on. That's one of the things we've been able to carry on doing during lockdown. They're about alliance building and providing space for many other groups and projects to come together and, and you know, and meet and to organize. And uh, we all need these spaces in our communities, particularly post COVID to come back out and to reconnect and to help the local economy, help the local environment. Mm. And I think over the last 30, 40 years, there's been a gradual sort of loss of community spaces and connections and, and coming into places for people to come into community and connect with each other but mm. particularly since the last uh, the financial crisis we had something called austerity where um the government took away a lot of funding to a lot of spaces and community spaces in our in our local areas um and so people have become more and more separate and right now we do need to come back together and we're going to need local food so i think you have some rural um centers uh, or you're looking at regenerative farming in some way or rooftop gardens yeah we're looking to you know promote uh teaching people to grow food again uh, growing food in the city during world war ii we grew on every available rooftop and garden space and window box um we're trying to encourage that culture a bit again uh we're facing a, a triple food crisis here in in the uk you know um with, with uh, Brexit has affected food uh, mm -hmm. deliveries and yeah. things. So, you know, you've got climate change, you know, and there's a whole range of things that affect our food chain. And so what we really need to be doing is learning to grow food in our cities again. And we're also trying to link up with landowners who might want to say link with a climate emergency center group that wants to plant trees or, or that kind of thing. Um, you know, it, it's about building community adaptation and, and community resilience and food resilience and things like that. And uh, the more we can link up these projects and people can be more prepared uh, and also focus on solutions. Really, one of the things we found through our 30 year journey is that there are thousands and thousands of eco solutions out there. But the problem is our mainstream media and our governments are uh, not focusing on those solutions. And in fact, they're funding the problems rather than the solutions. But mm. if we get a bit of a change where we have community led solutions, we have these uh, kind of community or people's assemblies every month or two in, in the centers that feed both into the center mm. organizing coordinator circle and also out to the local council and mm. tell them what the local community would like to see. Because quite often we found over the years, pe people have half of the solutions already thought out when you go to a local community and Mm. I'll ask them what the problems are, what they want done. They're, they're halfway to working the solutions out already. We encourage an energy audit uh, by mm. any group that goes in, how much energy has been used, replace things to LEDs, and if they can, put in renewables, wind or solar. Mm. And, and recycling, do you, do you encourage people to kind of recycle, refill all those, this kind of... Yeah, yeah. One, of, yeah well. one of the themes is recycle, reuse. We're going to start doing a recycle, reuse fair only secondhand mm -hmm. things to be to be brought there and and mm -hmm. so and also like a repair cafe transition town local transition town group does a, a repair cafe thing where people will bring in old videos and toasters mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, sew things or well you know uh, solder them together mm -hmm. rather than buying new if we really encourage this recycle yeah. reuse circular mm -hmm. economy yeah i mean there'll be a, the people in the older community that are very good with their hands and you know can repair things really easily and, and have spare time to do that it, and it gets them together more as a group. Um, I, I love the I love the positive kind of angle that you're pushing as well. You know, like climate change. You know, we're all aware that it's it's a problem, but rather than making it a problem, make it kind of you know energetic and 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 yeah. encouraging behind yeah. it. You know, yeah. There's something about because it because it, there is you know as you come to terms with the climate crisis and what's actually happening. 
yeah. it is and it has a massive impact on your mental health and as soon as you start start doing something and doing something positive yeah. that's what starts to get you out of that funk and start moving forward one of the things that phoenix really loves is the about having getting the different generations together mm -hmm. because you have all of these skills in older generations which have been lost and, and the yep. younger ones yeah, and, and yeah. this energy and these ideas so you bring those together and you get all this new stuff mm. coming yeah yeah we've been yeah. So dependent on an unsustainable system and we don't know how to, to grow things the way people used to we don't know how to make things the way that we used to and we need to have that wisdom it's really crucial none of us are quite old enough to actually remember the marshall plan but uh you are mentioning the eco marshall plan that we would like to bring into the future Mm -hmm. Why don't we put our resources to, you know, restoring our climate instead of, say, nuclear, we nuclear weapons or, you know. I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that one. You know, it's absolutely really, really incredibly important. You know, we need a plan that stretches beyond all borders. And for those who I grew up in kind of, you know, my dad was in the military, you're kind of, you know, looking at World War II a lot, our generation. And, you know, mm -hmm. our, at the end of World War II, there was this Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. A lot of funds got put in to rebuild buildings and universities and all, all sorts of infrastructure and you know we should be allocating billions to repairing the environment to setting up climate emergency centers to working on solutions all the solutions are out there wind mm. solar water power alternative energy systems permaculture community currencies you know the list goes on you know you can you can generate energy out of plants you know there's mm. so mm. much more we could be doing um, but the spaces aren't there the funding isn't there enough and you know the resources and, and the, that cooperative attitude beyond borders we need all races all cultures all levels of our society all across the whole spectrum of society to cooperate together whether that's a local business the local community groups the local council it needs everybody now and there's a lot of talk about the green industrial revolution and over the pond you, you you're talking about it as well the green green new deal uh, we'll see where that goes. But, I, you know, as you mentioned international, I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, we know there are going to be climate migrants. And of course, Brexit was an idea to shut down the border so you didn't have to deal with them, people. But we, the world will have to deal with its migrants, its climate migrants. And, you know, we either do it in a humane way or we wind up with a lot of warfare and a lot of misery. Um, the climate centers that you're setting up could potentially around the world become uh, centers for migrants, people somewhere we could, you know, absorb people, process people, help them. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. We went to, we had a, a Brighton, there was Brighton had a meeting. Brighton is on the coast, south coast of, of mm. England. And they were talking about what, what would the, the Brighton Climate Emergency Center focus on. And because they're on the coast, they talked about migrants and refugees coming over. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. And, and being able to look after them as they come in. Yeah. We, we need to find new ways of living, you know, as you were just saying earlier, that, that you know, our system is, is broken, it's consuming things so fast, mm. you know, we need to, to, to redesign the whole system, we need system change, not climate change, and I suppose what climate emergency centres are is a bit uh, like, uh, I think it's the Buckminster Fuller quote about, you know, uh, you need to create the new paradigm next to the old paradigm, and then the uh, old paradigm will fall away, you know, we mm. need to show people through these community-led solution centers that there are hundreds of solutions and when we all come together and share resources and cooperate a much more you know beautiful sustainable future is possible but as mm. I say we need the spaces and the political will and the, and the resources to do it. Well we learned during COVID that we could live on less and do less and travel less and um, our you know it, it did somewhat bring into question, do we need to really be producing all these products that we don't actually need or buying all these clothes that we don't actually have to have? Uh, you know, can, can we have thrift shops? Can you buy from a thrift shop, you know, instead of from a, from a retailer? Mm. You know, all of that um, creates new possibilities as we move into more localized uh, community resilience where we're not dependent on, on, you know, things that we didn't realize we were dependent on until they went <laughs> away. And so to be prepared for that and to have people psychologically prepared for that is really critical. Mm -hmm. So we love what you're doing. Less, less. We need, we need more of them. You know, uh, I think that the Scottish government allocate 40 million pounds for climate hubs. Whereas um, I'm not okay. sure you know, mm -hmm. the rest of the UK government uh, has, has done that yet. <laughs> um, and, and get excited and have some hope and feel like we are making a difference because 
you know, we all get up and down and talking on the mental health thing. But one of the things that's made me feel better over the years is getting involved and doing something and you feel part of something. And I've seen the, the magic that comes in when someone wanders into one of these centres and uh, they, mm -hmm. you know, whatever's mm -hmm. going on in their life, they might not feel as connected or whatever, or they're alone. And they come in mm -hmm. and they, they join a group and they've become part of something and they feel like they're making a difference by whatever it is, recycling. Well, the solution to um, climate anxiety is climate action. Yeah. And to, to have, um, so I wonder also, you know, the, the political possibilities of, of working for changing laws and uh, I think you have citizen assemblies there that have some advisory capacity with the government. Um, are these centers, can they be utilized to uh, lobby for action, um, to uh, influence the political uh, picture? Are you using them that way? One of the things that are involved in the climate emergency centers is um, having people's assemblies on a regular basis, so regularly getting the community to come in and talk to talk about what it is that they want and trying to kind of get people involved. So there's an, another network here that, that we're sort of allied with called Trust the People, which um, runs a course that gets people activated and getting people, you know, how to get the skills and knowledge to go out into the community and activate and get something done. Um, so though that have within a climate emergency center is a really useful way to start getting people active, engaged, confident in raising their voices and saying something and knowing how to get something done. So mm -hmm. people's assemblies on a regular basis in the climate emergency center will feed into what's, what people want in their climate emergency center, but then also feeds out to the, the council. And as people become more active and more confident and more able to say, actually, my opinions matter, I've got something to bring here, they're more likely to go, okay, politically, I can do something now. I can raise my voice. I can, I can go, I can stand mm -hmm. for council. I can stand for whatever, because mm -hmm. I've got something to bring. So it's about building that confidence as well, letting mm. people know actually you are, you've got a lot to bring and we need all of us. Well, in America, we have something called the Citizens, and Citizens Climate Lobby, mm. which decided to focus on carbon tax as, as, you know, let's all focus on this one issue. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that focusing of a large group of people on, a, on, a, on one point um, has, has been quite productive actually. And I think we're moving closer to getting those kinds of uh, laws mm. in this country. Um, yeah, we've got something similar called the CE bill over here. Climate and ecological emergency bill is, is an attempt to actually change policy and the laws in this country. I think there's about 120 MPs supporting it so far. There's a total of 600 MPs roughly. So it needs to get, you know, it needs to get over the 300 to, to get a majority. Mm -hmm. But it's building, it's building support and more joining up all the time. So, you know, we really hope something like that can go through because so often we are dealing with the, the the tentacles of the octopus, shall we say, the problems, and really we need to go to the heart of the matter and change some policy, and it really needs some intelligent, intelligence and wisdom right at the top of our, our, mm. our, our country's diagrams, and internationally with this, we need some kind of eco-martial plan, you know, to, to come back to that, and, you know, we do need to change policies, there's an eco-side law being talked about, uh, Polly, uh, Polly Higgins pushed that, you know, we, we need changes in policy, um, we're still operating with policies from 20, 30 years ago, and uh, mm. it's not really caught up with the science of what's actually going on at the moment. Glenn, did you want to talk about Barcelona a little bit or, or being, um, how, how this might apply internationally? Well, I, th I think it has a lot of potential here. I think I like the idea of like maybe a climate festival, you know, like maybe mm -hmm. something like that, like yeah. a climate street festival where you can get people kind of explaining what's going on and, and educating in a way. Um, but also showing solutions as well. Show exactly. I think a lot of people find it difficult to hear how mm. bad it is unless they can yeah. see the way forward. Some mm. people can cope with, oh my God, it's really bad and I'm just going to sit with all that awful feelings and try mm. and, and yeah. work through it. Other people yeah, need to know, what do I do about it? Then I can hear mm. it. Yeah. So you need those yeah. And if you point them in the right direction to say, this is what you can do about it, then, yeah. then I mean, got I've, I've got a passion for food waste and food waste prevention. And I think that you know, one thing I've learned with that is that, you know, that, you know, the icebergs are melting, but mm. you can actually, by preventing throwing things away, you are, you actually are part of that, you know, and it, yeah. if you can give something like a normal person, something that they can do in an everyday life, and mm. then they feel like they're doing something about it, then it's, you know, that, that is going to be part of the solution, I think. You know, we live on a very mm. abundant planet. There's enough 
homes and houses and buildings to house everyone, enough food to feed everyone. We just need mm. to redesign the system so that it works for everyone. Something I'd like to ask is the metrics behind it. Is it? Is it? Do you? Is is there some kind of way of, uh, you know, because I'm reading a lot of recently about well-being economy and and kind of, you know, measuring the economy on on the well-being of those people. Is is there a way of measuring that within your centres and like that? You know, We're how hoping... how it changes the the community in general. Good question. We were working with the University of Sheffield and a couple of other universities. Basically, the idea was when we were going to be open, it's been a bit difficult with open closing with COVID, but um, mm. the idea was when we were open, we were going to record all the metrics, how many people came in, how many jobs created, how many mm. this and the other. We've got a little bit from one of our previous community centres in Dalston, but how that improves mm -hmm. the local business, um, yep. you know, and there's even a theory that, you know, crime goes down in an area when you have community spaces and, and mm. you know, spaces mm. where people can meet, cooperate, get into employment, do things, you know. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we'd like to study the metrics and then show that to other councils around the country and, and government. So this is why we need a, a policy mm. change that empty buildings should be, you yeah. know, should be offered mm. up to the local community in a more, you know, in, in a better way, you know. Yeah, well, let's use what we already have and stop producing new things that we don't need in general. Yeah. <laughs> so. Everything we need right here. Um, yeah, I was going to say as well, on an international level, it is really important. If there are people doing things in other countries that like this, um, get in touch. We want to know. We want to link up. We want to connect. Um, it's so important that mm. we all kind of start sharing across, yeah, across the world as well, not just... Yeah. Just a little example of that. Yeah, please get in touch, you know, email climateec uh, at gmail.com. You know, one of the things in the handbook is reach out to 50 general groups that could be in your town, whatever that is, you know, uh, local farmers groups or elderly people's groups, youth groups, transition town groups, friends of the earth groups. And uh, half the groups might know each other already, but the other half like, oh, I never realised we had a wildlife group here in this town or, a, you know, a mm. farmer's market in this town or, you know, whatever it is. And bring all those groups together to cooperate and work on solutions. And hopefully we've got we've got some hope for the future and a chance to build a more sustainable future for everyone. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Um, lots of great information and uh, we wish you all the best with your project and hopefully it will spread further around the world. And we, we know that we all need to work together. Hmm. We would love to link up with any any of your groups watching this. Please do get in touch. Let's form a big network around the world and, and get on with the Eco Marshall Plan. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.